let's get this rolling. Welcome to our inaugural 2022 Urban Ecology Collaborative uh, meeting. My name is David Meshulam. I am Executive Director of Speak for the Trees, Boston, and I'm calling from my home in Watertown. And I'm joined today by Kinsey, co-chair of UEC. Hi, everybody. I'm Kinsey Miller. I am co-chair of the UEC. I am an arborist at Northwood Tree Care in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, welcome to our monthly Urban Ecology Collaborative meeting. Uh, we are a group of groups of urban foresters and urban greeners from uh, up and down the East Coast in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. Uh, we just share our experiences, our successes and our failures to help each other learn uh, and become better urban foresters and a wonderful and strong network of urban greening up and down uh, the coast and into the into the inland. Um, so welcome today, and we have a wonderful talk today from Paige Warren. So, Debbie, if you want to introduce Paige. Well, before we do, and I, I'm, I will be honored to introduce her, um, <laughs> I wanted to first open up the, the uh, floor for any announcements or mm. shares that people want to have. And then also, I know, Kinsey, you have an announcement about our next speaker. Yes. So maybe we can start there. Um, you want to introduce briefly who, who's joining us next week? Yes, this month uh, we Sorry, have month. Dave Muffley joining us from Oktopia. He designed the urban forest at Apple Park uh, out here in, I'm, I'm in California right now. <laughs> so out here in California um, uh, where he was hired by Steve Jobs. So it's about the urban forest on that campus and uh, we're excited to, to learn about it. And that will be, what date is that? Exactly the same date, just change it from February to March. March 16th at 10 a.m. There you go. That's the beauty of February. Indeed. Um, any other announcements from folks? Um, yeah, I have one. Um, some of you in this group may not know this, but I changed roles from field operations coordinator at the Emerald Necklace Conservancy to urban ecologist at Mass Audubon. And the position for field operations manager at the Emerald Necklace Conservancy is open right now. So if you guys know any good urban park managers, um, it's a really critical position to Boston urban ecology, urban forestry. Um, so please, uh, I'll put the link in the chat. And if you could share, or if you, anyone comes to mind, please let me know. Thanks. Any other announcements? No? All right, so um, without further ado, I'm just gonna pull up my brief introduction of Paige here. We're joined today by Professor Warren out of UMass Amherst. Um, and I met Paige a couple of years back at a talk she gave at a conference in um, at UMass, an urban forestry community conference from, I think it was a DC, I can't remember which one it was. I was so taken by her work, I, I went up and um, I said, hey, I'm trying this new thing in Boston and uh, I'm looking for someone to help with X, Y, and Z. Do you know anyone? She said, oh yeah, I have the perfect person for you. Introduced me to Evan, who's on the call today. Um, and since then, Evan and I have worked closely together, um, and Evan's now at BU. Um, so Paige, thank you for that introduction. Um, so a little bit about Paige. She has been doing research in urban ecology for the past 22 years, working in cities around the US. Uh, her lab seeks to understand processes generating and maintaining biological diversity in a world becoming increasingly dominated by us humans. She focuses on the impacts of urbanization on animals from the population to the community level, as well as the relationships between humans and urban nature. She has led uh, several, led an NSF funded urban long-term research area explorer project in Boston. If I'm not mistaken, that was uh, with UEI, the Urban Ecology Institute, um, plays a leading role in long-term ecological research projects in Phoenix and Baltimore as well and has co-led an international working group focused on biodiversity in cities. Uh, the title of her talk today is 
who has access to nature and the city? Urban social inequities and biodiversity often converge, but not always. So uh, thank you, Paige, for joining us today. Very good to be here. Um, this is, uh, I, I've been in, involved in some uh, uh, UEC meetings when I first came to UMass and for several years, and I don't know exactly how I got unplugged, and so I'm very happy to be getting plugged back in. Um, I've always found UEC to be such an inspiring group of people, and um, as I sit over here doing the sort of academic work that uh, it's sort of be connected with, with this really wonderful mix of, of researchers and practitioners is so is always so inspiring to me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting reconnected. And then I'll just also say that I'm in a new role as department head for our department here. And so there's, um, I'm hoping that maybe I can also plug our whole department in some ways. And with, we've got some new folks that maybe I'll suggest for future UEC talks. So maybe we can keep getting, keep tying things together. Shall I go ahead and share my screen here and jump in? Um, when I was working on my talk this morning, I forgot what title I gave y'all, so it's, it's not the same title, but it's basically the same talk, so <laughs> here's the present button, oh, let me go down here, there we go, ah, there we go, ah, there we go, all right, so there's a lot of people who I work with, and I tried to credit a bunch of, credit a bunch of them here on the, on the first slide, and, and I'll try to credit them as I go along, and some funders here. I'm um, going to talk kind of mishmashing a couple of different sets of work together and try to tell a few stories. Um, but a lot of the funding for this has come from the different funders at the bottom there. And that Verbionet network is the um, international working group that Debbie mentioned at the beginning. So um, anyway, so I want to want to thank a bunch of people who have contributed to this work. So let's just start with an image of, uh, of a place. Um, this is a a pocket park that we've done some of our work in, and um, and where's the nature? What what's the nature in the picture? And and this is you know something I do with people who are less tied into urban ecology than y'all are, but but this is the sort of exercise of thinking about what's what is nature? What do we you know what do we notice? What we think? What do we which parts of this picture do we think of as nature? And and what does it mean for people? And what sort of access to nature? Um, are we looking for in urban places? And, um, and this is also an urban place. This is, um, this is a photo from, from a urban forest in Mattapan. So it, um, what's more nature? What kind of nature do people want? There's, there's sometimes we want the kind of nature in, in the park there with the benches and the, the grass and the open space to run around. And sometimes we want the kind of nature where it's a trail and a dense forest. And um, I think there's some, there's some obvious differences in those places in the kinds of species and kinds, kinds of uh, animals that we're going to find in those places. Um, but one of the things that we still are kind of grappling with in academia is, is sort of what do these different kinds of nature mean for people? How much, how much does it matter? to people, which kind of nature we have around us. Um, I think it's pretty clear that having some access to nature is really important for well-being. Um, and I have to say, if you look for pictures of like urban nature and people and like what it means to people, it's almost always white people in the pictures. So I just want to acknowledge that <laughs> that, that is, an, is a, a really big bias in when we're talking about this stuff and the, and the imagery that comes up. But, but uh, this was such a joyful picture that I decided to put it in. So, are there disparities in access to biodiversity? Who has access to nature in the city? Um, and I'm gonna kind of interchangeably talk about biodiversity and nature, even though I recognize that there's a lot of different, um, that, that nature is not just biodiversity. There's, there's particular kinds of species that might be, matter more to people than the total biodiversity. But we're gonna to try to get into that a little bit, but to start with, are there, are there disparities? And do these disparities in access lead to measurable differences in people's outcomes, in our physical health, mental health, and economic well-being? And it turns out both of these questions can be kind of tricky to answer. Um, so I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to tell a couple of stories and try to tie it together to some global analyses we've done and then try to tie it back to Boston a little bit at the end. Um, so we're going to take you out to Phoenix, which is the first place that I did some of this work. Um, and this is a this is a, a park in Phoenix, and and 
just to give you a sort of visualization of when when biodiversity sort of lines up in a way that there are big disparities in access to biodiversity. This is a, this Phoenix turns out to be a really great example of that, uh, for better for worse. So, so this is an, a, a a park in a neighborhood in a very upscale, wealthy, um, predominantly white neighborhood in 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 Phoenix, and you see a lot of um, not necessarily native plants here, but definitely sort of desert-like plants, and we tend to find lots of desert birds here. And then here's a park in a lower income central Phoenix neighborhood, predominantly black and um, Latina neighborhood. And you see a, not any desert kind of plants and you see plants from other places and you typically are not gonna see desert, desert birds here, um, even though Phoenix is a desert, desert city. And, and there's a lot of different things, that, a lot of studies now that show this sort of lining up of socioeconomic status with biodiversity and other things that matter to people too. So, so we had some early studies that showed income was related to higher bird diversity, but also um, the temperature in, in the so cooler parts of, of this hot city are prominently in the wealthier areas. And then also the, not just the amount of species, but the kinds of species. So at the top of the picture on the right here, we have a, a European starling, so a broadly distributed um, not a uh, bird that's not native to the Phoenix region is in predominantly lower income, predominantly black and Latinx neighborhoods. And then the, the wealthy white neighborhoods tend to have some of these um, more greater access to some of these very sort of distinctive species that sort of make the desert unique. So like the curved bill thrasher or my, one of my favorite birds over here on the left, the Say's Phoebe that says its name, it says Say, like it's Say, I'm the Phoebe. So. Um, so these are this is, is this like sort of package of work that has come together to, um, with Phoenix to, to show these sort of big disparities um, in uh, lots of different features that um, that have to do with with nature, people's access to nature, and uh, their experience of nature. But how about like how how common is that experience? And so this is this international working group that we got together, and uh, uh, unfortunately Evan in the bottom right didn't get to to go to the workshop that we had and, and we sort of brought him in after the workshop to join us on this analysis. And then he, and then he very capably led this, um, this global analysis to see, are those patterns in Phoenix uh, commonly found in other parts of the world? So we ended up with uh, 34 studies of 34 cities. Um, and we were looking at, at because there was, the most of the studies that look at this kind of thing, at whether there's sort of disparities in um, in plant diversity or disparities in bird diversity, uh, most most of the studies of disparities in biodiversity have to, are done on plants and birds. So that's kind of why we've got this, this these two groups. Um, we did look at at if there were other animals that people had looked at, but their birds and plants are the are the main ones um, that there's a lot of data on. So so we wanted to take com compare these studies and find out um, not just sort of how many are finding, are finding this, the same kind of pattern we're seeing in Phoenix, but are we actually even seeing different patterns and what are some of the potential mechanisms that might be leading to those patterns? So we used a, um, a, 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 a kind of unusual approach that was, was new to me when we, when we were working with it that has to do with, so instead of uh, some of your common meta-analyses, for those of you who do that kind of work, it's. Uh, Instead of like looking for effect sizes or things like that, we were just looking qualitatively at the outcomes. Do you tend to find that the relationship between biodiversity and socioeconomic status is sort of increasing, like like the Phoenix pattern, or is it that in lower, like maybe the opposite pattern, where say in lower income areas there's higher biodiversity, or is it so neutral that you don't see this pattern at all? Um, and, and what sorts of places do you find those patterns and what are, so to try to get help us understand what some of the mechanisms might be and, and, and therefore then, you know, what we might want to do about it. And one of the, kind of the biggest findings we have is that from that study is that where there are inequalities that tilt toward wealth, it tends to be in uh, residential lands and in low density cities, which was so, something we had predicted so again, looking at, at the sort of aerial photo of Phoenix, these are sort of two different neighborhoods and the, and the, the sort of parcels are, parcel sizes are quite similar. There's not big differences in, in housing density across these, 
these, this landscape, um, but there's big differences in, um, in what's in people's scarves. And so the, the sort of capacity to be able to, um, to be able to, the, so the wealth kind of brings with it capacity to, to put in more plants in your yards and attract more birds. And so that's one of the ways, but there's many other mechanisms that, that can then kind of counteract this. Um, so there are cities where, where municipal investment seems to be maybe having a, a, an effect on counteracting the, the, this disparity so that in, um, and where there's lots of public green space then that has been invested in, you can, you can kind of flip this tilt and, and be able to, um, and so some of the cities where there's no relationship, there seems to be some role of municipal investment. And then here's an example of, of kind of the opposite pattern from Phoenix. So one of the things we uh, found was that in some sort of tropical cities, um, and again, we were trying to figure out sort of what are some of the, the general patterns. So, um, and, and I have to say that, that there are very few uh, examples of from some of these kinds of areas. So this is very kind of tentative work that we'd like to, to see more of. Um, but here's an example in, in Belo Horizonte in Brazil that, uh, that the, the authors of the study invoked sort of human disturbance and said that the wealthier areas in this, in this city um, had higher levels of, human, of disturbance. And by disturbance, they also mean just built structure and density and things. Um, and that they found lower uh, biodiversity, lower richness in those, in those areas. Um, so there's very sort of context dependence to these relationships. And, and again, I'd say that the sort of tilting toward wealth in, in, in low density cities is one of the most common patterns, but there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of variability from place to place and, and, a, and a clear sort of message that there are some, there's, there's potential role for, um, for, uh, for other mechanisms besides, you know, to, to counteract these, the, these sort of wealth disparities um, with investment, with social organizing and things like that. So coming back to our big questions that I raised at the beginning, are there disparities in access to biodiversity? Okay, so we found that there, there are frequently, not always the same uh, playing out in the same way in, in the, all cities. And, and we also that we need more data. We need more, like we need to sort of, in order to really understand the mechanisms and then to understand what, um, what processes are gonna help us um, address disparities, we, we need information from more places. Um, and, and, and really to even, to, and that's just even to get at the first question, much less the question of, can we actually measure how that matters to people? Um, which tends to require large data sets in order to disentangle all the different factors that affect things like mental health or, or well-being. So I got together recently with um, Nathan Chan, who's a resource economist at UMass, and several graduate students, um, a couple from UMass and Deja Perkins, who's a graduate student at North Carolina State, who'd been studying um, uh, using, so Deja had been doing work with some different kinds of, of, um, of community science uh, or uh, crowdsource data sets like eBird. And we we're like, hey, maybe we can use sort of big data sets like eBird who, um, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about eBird in case you're not familiar with it in just a moment. What can we use some of those big data sets to help us get big data that we can use to try to tease apart some of these different um, uh, factors affecting people's outcomes. But, but we quickly ran into some, some, some challenges with that as well. Um, so, Hate to make this a story all about challenges, but there, but there are some really uh, key challenges that we wanted to get into. So we thought, you know, with crowdsource data sets, um, that might help us get around some of these. If we want to get, we want, if we want to do comparisons across cities and states and regions, um, and address all these confounding variation, you know, having sort of big data set with fine scaled resolution that can help us look within cities and over time would be great. And so. Ebert seemed like a perfect one because um, it's a crowdsource data set. There's hundreds of million, hundreds of millions of bird sightings. It's worldwide, um, and it's and this very accessible data set that um, that they make publicly available. So we said, well, let's see what we can find in Ubird. Um, and Boston, and let's just take Boston and Phoenix, two places that we know well, and and take a look at what sorts of of data we can get, but. We quickly discovered, um, especially talking with, with Deja and looking at some of the other studies out there that use eBird, 
that we might have some issues with data, um, with the amount of, of basically the distribution of where eBird sightings come from. Um, so, so then we started actually kind of down another track of saying, hmm, what about what, you know, are all of these studies, um, are they actually sampling well enough for us to be able to tell whether there's a relationship between whether we have disparities in access to biodiversity. So basically this, what we're talking about is this key challenge is sort of what we call some sample selection. And this is where the resource economists kind of took me into a new path um, of, of trying to understand the sample selection process. Um, basically trying to figure out if there's bias in, um, in, in data sets, these large crowdsource data sets like eBird. And, if, and is that bias going to affect our ability to, to look at questions about relationships between, between biodiversity and socioeconomic status or income or race? So one of the things Nathan sort of proposed is like, if you don't, if you're not getting your sample sampling right, you can actually get an answer that's the opposite from the truth, the opposite from the true answer. So his example for this, I absolutely love, is uh, so this is just like made up data, but but if you take the, the the cloud in the bottom bottom panel, and you imagine that this is a, a data set on the relationship between, uh, uh, let, let's just use something completely different. So handling of uh, people's height and their ability to um, to their their basketball handling ability. <laughs> you have some like index of your ability to 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 um, uh, make baskets in basketball. If you were to look at the whole population, you don't see a really big relationship between ball handling ability and height. Um, but if you took only the NBA players, which would be the both, which would be a group of people that are both high in their ball handling skills and very tall, then that and you looked at the relationship between ball handling ability and height, you could actually get um, a, a negative relationship. Um, so this is a completely made up example, but it kind of gives you, I think, the idea that, that, that if you're not careful about where you're getting your data from, that you can get answers that, that are, are in fact not representative of the truth. And how does this, well, sort of, how does this matter? So, um, so we, we took a quick look first at Boston and said, okay, where are the eBird checklists coming in? And so a checklist is when somebody makes, is out looking at birds, they can upload their information into eBird. And so the, the, the number of birds that they see and which kinds of birds they see is, is then encoded into this giant database. Um, and, and there just turn out to be big disparities across um, here in the Boston metro area. Um, like dark blotches here are census tracts where there's a lot of checklists being reported and the light colored ones are where there's uh, and there's gray ones where there's like no no data being reported whatsoever. There's no checklist. So, so in other words, the information. This is kind of like a, a map of information. The information that we're getting on where birds are is uh, is very patchy across here. Um, and and so we we wanted to look at this in relationship to variables that are often used to characterize socioeconomic status, like um, racial uh, percentages and income. And, and so, you know, you, you can only, it's hard to sort of eyeball this. So what we did is put it together into some analyses and very quickly found out that there were some big relationships between where, and again, not too surprising probably to all of you, that the places that people report birds into eBird are predominantly um, higher income areas, much more checklists in, in wealthier areas um, and in predominantly white census tracts. So, and then we also modeled like what, you know, if you were to just make up a random data set um, of income by biodiversity with, a, with a, where there's no relationship, where the, say, let's say the true relationship is that there's no relationship, but then you, but then you neglect to, if you sort of carve that, that up and you neglect to get data from the most low income areas, um, then you could actually end up with a relationship where the, you actually see something that isn't true, that, that the, that, that biodiversity declines with increasing wealth. Um, so we sort of both with real data and with some modeling um, kind, of, kind of convinced ourselves that this could be a real problem 
And so that one of the things that we need to do in order to go forward and to be able to understand these disparities in access to biodiversity is also really understand where we're getting our data from and make sure that we're getting it in a way that's representative across the entire city. So the bottom line is that sample selection matters. Um, we see strong associations between race, income, and eBird activity. Again, this shouldn't be too surprising, um, but that does mean that the information that we have about disparities is from sources like eBird is going to be difficult. It's going to be problematic for studying disparities in particular, so that we might need more systematic sampling, um, which is more labor intensive and sometimes difficult to get. So, so it's making it a challenge for us to really look in a comprehensive way across, let's say, the United States at look at different kinds of cities in where these relationships are being found. But to head back to Boston, even if we just say, all right, we recognize that um, that that some that that there is a potential for disparities, and and we would like to try to do things to rectify that by say increasing greenness within within census tracts. So this is an, an older study of ours that um, where we looked at what it would take to add enough trees to increase tree canopy and even it out across the, the city of Boston. And, and even when we, and we did these three different scenarios, and even when we sort of this green equity scenario on the right, where we sort of, um, we, we took maps and tried to put as many different trees as we possibly could into the, into the areas that had the least trees, um, we still couldn't really change this coefficient of, of equity all that much. Um, so the closer to zero is, is closer to perfect equity. So it's difficult to it's difficult to achieve equity. There's constraints on achieving equity that are that um, that have to do with the physical structure of the city and the environment. Um, whoops, there we go. Um, but even little bits can matter. So we have other data that shows that 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 even if we can't achieve perfect equity in access to greenness and access to, to biodiversity, that that it's still worth um, that, that, that small differences can, small increases in the amount of greenness. So this is basically um, where we found that the addition of even 150 square meters of green space, um, which is the size of like two parking spaces, can, can amount to one additional bird species in, in small greening um, areas in the city of Boston. And then also um, people's perception of living in high density areas can be sort of mitigated by greenness. So places with the similar density, when you show people pictures of places with similar density, but with more trees, um, then uh, people favor those places. So, um, so there's the potential for greenness to also, uh, even small amounts of increases in greenness in high density areas to make a difference to people's perceptions of a, of a place as a nice place to be. And we have some evidence from Phoenix that people are more satisfied living in places that have higher bird diversity. Um, so this is survey work that we did in Phoenix. And, and we've done this now over multiple, um, multiple surveys over multiple years and consistently find this finding that, that places with higher desert bird richness are places that people find more, are, are more satisfied with in the city of Phoenix. So I think this gives us some answers to these questions, but not all of them. So I think it's sort of like a resounding Probably yes. That there, are, we, we're, there definitely are disparities in access to biodiversity in many, many cities around the globe. Um, the context matters, and the mechanisms are varied from place to place. But do these disparities lead to me measurable differences in people's outcomes? Again, we're getting some hints of that, but it's going to be challenging to study that in a really comprehensive way because of some of the sample selection issues and the and the difficulty in getting data sets that allow us to really disentangle all the different factors. Um, but, I, but I don't think that means we need to sort of throw up our hands. I think that, that, that it, it's still pretty clear that, um, that, that, making, that making strides towards increasing people's access um, to nature in the city are going to have um, some positive outcomes, both in terms of, of actually just increasing the populations of, of species, as well as as making a difference to people. All right, so that was a bit of a whirlwind and I would love to take some questions. Amazing Paige, I love that picture of you um, on the second to last slide of 
in the red hat, smiling. Oh. <laughs> that was uh, sorry. I meant to put a credit in. That was the Girls Inc. Um, we were doing a, a workshop with Eureka program with Girls Inc. And um, they came to UMass and we were looking at birds at UMass. So, so that's very fine. cool. Well, I so appreciate this. And it makes me think of um, so much of the discussion around uh, birding and race that's been happening over the past couple of years, um, the black birders. Um, and, and the work they've been doing to really profile um, inclusionary practice around around yeah. birding. Um, I should mention that Deja Perkins is one of the co-leads of the of the Black Birders Week. Great. So, so she's and she's got. Uh, I would really encourage looking her up. She's doing her PhD at North Carolina State now and looking at um, continuing to look at these kinds of issues of disparities and access to nature. So she's a rising star. And Black on this week, totally, yes. Um, so there are a couple of, of questions in the chat window and, and we can start there. Um, or, you know, Georgina, if you just want to read your question, I, I don't have to read it, um, but I'm happy to if you want. I... Oh, uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Hi, this is such interesting work. Thanks so much. Um, I was um, wondering if you've ever looked into look using iNaturalist as a, way to look at this and particularly the city nature challenge is you know um a once a year effort to really get a lot of observations um you could skew it um where you worked with partner organizations to try to get the observations in the places that typically you don't get the observations and that could be a way to crowdsource the data but then also get it to answer your questions better so i was just wondering if you'd ever thought about that yeah, no, that's a great point. And so we talked a little bit about in this paper about sort of yeah the use of campaigns, you know, sort of active campaigns to try to um, to build up these data, these crowdsourced databases because they have so much strength and they they're, they've been used for a lot. Of, I don't want to want to make sure I'm clear that these crowdsourced databases are are really amazingly useful databases and things like eBird have been great from being able to like track patterns of migration on on you know on large scales. Um, yeah, we have started looking with iNaturalist data. Uh, some of our collaborators in Arizona, we've been working with that data set. We had actually a couple of uh, undergraduate students do some projects kind of looking at what, what there already was for, for Phoenix with iNaturalist. We, we were going to do iNaturalist and eBird for this other, other project, and it was just clear that the places we were looking, the um, iNaturalist was across all species, and so you tend to have, you know, uh, it's like trying to figure out how to have enough data to look at a, um, at like at all. Uh, there's so much more stuff on just birds, um, and with you know you might get like a little bit of mammals and a little bit of insects and a little bit of but it's sort of patchy as to which things you get where in iNaturalist at least in the data set we were starting with it was like clear that we were going to have to do a lot more kind of. Uh, sort of data management before we could even start answering questions with, with that. But we are working with iNaturalist for, for Phoenix. So um, yeah, that's a, a, and I, I love this idea of, of having, you know, city nature challenges and these kinds of campaigns actually actively sort of get people to, to move out of the, 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 the well-trodden paths for, um, for, for observation. And we also have a question from uh, Marielle. Um, can you explain more about what is hindering equity structurally in the city? And I think that's in reference to the, the map you have of Boston. Is that right, Marielle? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Just you. I felt like you. Um, I was curious to know what the problems were are they like you know physical structural problems is it policy like what's hindering what's hindering that equity yeah so i kind of went blasted through that it was like as i threw that up i was like wow i didn't really give you a lot of context for that <laughs> for those maps first of it but um yeah so that was specifically looking at trees and so you know we use these kind of high resolution like i'm seeing dexter here like this is totally more like dexter's wheelhouse but <laughs> but what we had done at the time was um was sort of dive into each of these um these these little units that were um actually like traffic area units or something like that instead of census groups and and look at where there were already trees 
look what, where there were already, already buildings and pavement. And we made the assumption that we weren't gonna actually remove any buildings and pavement. We were just gonna look at anywhere that trees could be planted and put trees there. But then we sort of made up some rules about, you know, that were based on where tree planting can actually occur. If there were overhead wires, the tree could only be small. If there were, you know, if it was next to a big highway, then you, you, know, you weren't gonna have a big root mass. You can't have a big tree there either. So we made some rules about the sizes of the trees that sort of led to where we could get canopy over time and, um, and try to make the best case scenario without actually, you know, blowing up buildings or removing highways or things like that. So it's, it's very much constrained by what's, what built infrastructure was already there. And so I think that is the biggest factor is that places where there aren't a lot of trees, there is also a lot of buildings and pavement and, and also constraints about where, um, not, not just where you can plant trees, but how big they can be. Um, to, and so that just sort of imposes some constraints on um, it doesn't mean that there aren't other ways of going about this. And, and so thinking about green roofs and things like that, we, th this kind of analysis doesn't embed any of that kind of, of greenness. It was just about trees. So I think there are some ways to, to maybe move the needle more than what we were talking about there, because um, that was very sp specifically about trees. But yeah, I'd be interested in some of y'all's ideas about this, um, where, because I think, there, I think there's a lot of different ways to, to go up go about it. Um, but the physical constraints are one of the big ones. Can I, yeah. can I ask a further question? So equity, um, you know, everything that you're doing is so important. And in thinking about that, I was curious because, um, you know, in seeing these structural, so it's not about policy so much as it's about where people are living currently. And in these perhaps more marginalized spaces that might be like, light formerly um light industrial people moving in and opportunities then to go back and green them now that their uh people are living there is difficult is that right and then the other thing too is green roofs are really expensive like they have a really high dollar you know amount and those tend to be more in like you know fancy tony neighborhoods right. um so so, so that as a solution doesn't seem very um, viable, but potentially doing things like um, planting box. I've done work with um, doing, yeah, like planters, but then those are for, you know, herbaceous stuff. Yeah. And so, like I said, it's, if, you're, if your goal isn't just trees, but it's greenness, I think. Yeah. And so you're absolutely right. Like green roofs have a lot of limitations. I mean, also not just expense, but, but access, like, you know, who has access, they're not, they're not as open access as things that are ground level. So, um, so yeah, like community gardens, vacant lots, um, vacant lot greening, um, what you're talking about with planters, those are, those are, you know, strategies that we were not looking at in that particular study. And so I, you know, I couldn't speak to the opportunities for that in those, in that, uh, and how that would, it, it, so if, you, if we take a different measure besides trees and some other kind of measure of greenness and access to greenness, um, then we might be able to move the needle more. I do think that I wouldn't want to throw out policy as a as a, a factor, and and definitely in the, our sort of global analysis, there was um, there were a number of studies that really invoked policy and sort of invest municipal investment as a mechanism for counteracting disparities, um, and um, and also ones that invoked um, yeah sort of community organizing as a, as another mechanism. And so I think those things can go hand in hand, and we have a Another study where we looked at, um, you know, social capital and land trusts, and sort of that that um, wealth and social capital together got more land conservation than just one or the other. And so, so like having having the investment in um, uh, 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 organizations and nonprofits, um, so the, having the nonprofits, having the social organizing and the and the policy, I think kind of all can go together hand in hand. I hope that's answering your question. We have another question that just came in from Corey Bassett. Uh, do you see using measures of biodiversity as proxies of measures of intact or better ecosystems and thus access to more natural spaces? Since in some places non-natives can create spaces of very high species diversity, but very different from the native ecosystems. And Corey, you're welcome to unmute and elaborate on that if you'd like to. 
the enemy of his baby. Totally. Okay. Just I, I've, I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and, and so as I said, I was kind of glossing over some of that, and, and, and I tried to get into a little bit with our studies in, in Phoenix, where it's like, okay, it's not just the total number of species, but which kinds of species, and, 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 I, and I, but I think this is where, in terms of people's perceptions, and people's, what people want out of their green spaces, and what benefits people in terms of, of, of well-being, psychological health, I don't know that we can, we've really sort of parsed that, you know, is it like, do you, you know, just having a lot of species or is it like, you know, having a particular configurations of green space that are welcoming um, and maybe it doesn't matter how many species are there. Um, you know, I think we haven't really, that's what, and that's where we were sort of trying to get, okay, there's some, there's some nice big data sets where we could get at this, you know, we were going to try to look at, at different, um, different sort of vegetation structure versus whether there's particularly sort of charismatic species versus whether you know th those are some of the things we'd like to parse. Um, I should mention Riley and Andrade's work, um, who's been uh, a collaborator in Phoenix area. Um, put her name in the chat because I didn't put her on my slides. But um, but she's doing some really neat work with with survey research in Phoenix at getting at like um, so what are people's preferences for? Is it like again this is tying it specifically to birds, but you know, is it colorful birds? Is it birds that are associated with the desert specifically? Is it birds that sound nice to listen to? And so she was able to categorize birds based on a bunch of different features and start looking at at how people's per perceptions of birds sort of parse out in that way. And um, so I, I think we're sort of getting there, but we, but, um, but yeah, I think we, I, I'm, I, would, I would just bet that it isn't total biodiversity that matters to people. Like it just as a, as a, as a pretty, it seems like a pretty obvious guess <laughs> that is probably more specific things like vegetation structure or particular kinds of species that are really what contribute in a kind of measurable way to um, outcomes for people. Um, and so there's gonna be times when those things kind of line up with our, maybe our biodiversity conservation goals and goals and times when they don't. Um, and maybe that's okay, like especially if we're talking about high density urban areas, maybe our goals about biodiversity aren't the most important goals. Our goals are really about making this a place that people can thrive in and, and access to some kind of nature is important to that and it'll benefit some kinds of species. So that's great, um, but maybe we don't, you know, we, we sort of look for where we can find synergies and then sometimes we prioritize people's well being. A little bit related to, to that discussion of uh, quality and preference, Lindsay Lane Darling asks, you mentioned preferences for greener streets and improving high density housing and that people preferred places with more bird species. Did you test if those preferences are consistent across socio-demographic uh, socio groups and is there a citation for that work? Yeah, so um, the, the preferences, like that was, too small of a sample size to look at, at, at for, the, for the, the, the one that I showed you for Boston that was um, uh, with the showing of photos to people that we, we couldn't look at that, parse that by sociodemographic groups. The work that Riley's doing in Phoenix with the birds is parsed by sociodemographic groups and finding some differences. Um, so the, the, there's sort of the two largest kind of racial ethnic groups um, in Phoenix are basically sort of Anglo white folks and uh, 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 Hispanic Latino, Latinx, and, and in terms of what you can pull out of, of data sets, um, the, uh, it's gonna take a lot more targeted sampling to get at a broader spectrum of racial and ethnic diversity in, um, in Phoenix, but there are differences between those two groups in their sort of bird preference. I can't remember off the top of my head what some of those are. I think that paper has finally just been accepted. It went through a lot of rounds of revision with some very helpful reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so hopefully we'll have that citation soon. It's supposed to be, I think, in ecological applications. Um, but if you keep an eye out for Riley Andrade's work, that would be a good place to look. Thank you so much. Yeah. Paige, I think there's a lot of interest actually um, in getting more information on your research in general. So, you know, maybe after this um, meeting, we can follow up and, and get some citations with links or even PDFs that we can then share out with the group, if that's okay. Sure. Happy to, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, other I, questions? I, yeah, go ahead, Erica. Sorry. Sort of related to that, but this might not be a great question, um, but I'm just wondering, Paige, like 
in your mind, what is like the best way that you see practitioners using your research that's out there right now? Like, do you have ideas of how practitioners should, what they should grab first, what they should grab onto the hardest, what there are some <laughs> potentials for them to start using this stuff? Um, I guess I would, I mean, I think to me, it's some of the broad strokes that are most, um, most helpful is just sort of reinforcing this need for broader engagement um, and um, and for really looking across all of this, all of sort of, you know, racial, ethnic, socioeconomic um, areas. I, I think that's sort of one big takeaway. I think what we would ultimately like to do is have, a, have you know, more engagement about what we can be doing. <laughs> like, what are some of the things that we could be doing? Like, we tried to sort of, you know, with this urban greening study in Boston and saying, you know, does a little bit matter is to be able to sort of provide things that might be helpful to sort of, you know, argue that it's worthwhile doing this, especially when you're looking to funders or when you're looking to policymakers and things like that. So that was a goal of that study was to try to aid those organizations and sort of justifying that urban greening is, you know, even small amounts of urban greening are worth worth doing. Um, and then, uh, and then, like another goal of this sort of well-being analysis is again to be able to say, like, as you're going, as you're, as you're sort of making decisions about, you know, like climate mitigation efforts and things like that, uh, how important is it to build in biodiversity goals into those, and is it going to matter to people, or you know, what about those is going to matter to people and when? Um, so, so that's kind of where we were trying to head with that. And so I think if there's like, again particular um, ways that we can sort of structure our next steps to to get at things that people need to know in order to make decisions about um, again things like climate mit mitigation efforts around green infrastructure or something like that can we sort of try to build up the information that will help make some of those decisions great thank you so much and yeah the importance of small bits of urban greening is going to be very important in pretty much everything i do so thank you for that work A question about rats, is that what I'm seeing there? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'll read it out loud. One challenge about urban greening in New York City, this is from Georgina, is efforts to reduce the rat population. Do you have any experience with balancing these different goals? Yeah, I mean, what I see that is kind of like, like a part of a batch of, of challenges around um, biodiversity being messy. <laughs> you know, that potentially, we get more species with sort of what are perceived as messier landscapes. And that's um, some other work that Riley has been work, working on with um, arthropods, like with bugs and things in Phoenix and sort of like are the, we, we had this interesting kind of natural experiment where, um, you know, we call it a natural experiment. Other people call it like a, a, a really um, sort of economic downturn and the, and the housing crisis and things So we had, we had housing foreclosures all across Phoenix and um, places that were um, where there were foreclosures, then land, you know, some people's yard management, but, but the house would become abandoned and then, and then you know, sort of things would get a little wilder basically in, in those yards. And so we were able to pull out and that, that paper is still not, not published yet, but, um, but definitely this sort of relationship between messiness and perceived messiness and uh, changes in vegetation and changes in, in bugs and stuff. So um, we see that there as well. So I think we, like with the rats, it, you know, I, like this, there's these classic studies from the 1950s from Baltimore, I believe, um, this guy Davis, um, that looked at ba basically sort of uh, where you found lots of rats and what were some of the features, like what were some of this, it was really like sort of a habitat analysis for rats. Um, and, and, it, and it was, you know, I'd say that, that I'm not sure that, that it's really tied to kind of ecologically messy landscapes. I mean, this is me going out on a limb and we'd have to go back and check this, but um, that it's more due to sort of like, you know, trash and garbage and things like that and sort of like places that create lots of niches in, you know, um, streetscapes. So, so I'm, not I, 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 I'm not sure that the things that people think might be associated with rats are the things that are. Um, so I think we'd want to check that. Um, and I know, yeah. I know that's part of the the worry about like fruit trees, right? Is planting those, you know, you know, introducing food to vermin population, right? The complications around that. But I think yeah. in other landscape type of you know shade trees, it's it's I'm a tree guy, right? But that's less of a less of an issue with with shade trees. 
yeah, great for bringing up Jason Munchie South's work. Thanks, Dexter. That's a good point. Um, that's some more recent stuff that might have some of what those what those actual relationships are. Because there's like sometimes it's about more about the perception than it is about what is like what's actually attracting vermin or pests. Um, and so um, yes, yeah, so that can be um, sort of a different like that seems to leads to a different set of strategies anyway in terms of how to address that. Um, but, but there are some times when it just is, you know, a, a, it is kind of a conflict, like that you actually can't necessarily have both. So um, I think we have to acknowledge that and figure out where it is that we want to prioritize the sort of ecologically messy places in places that are acceptable to people. Fantastic. Well, we have a, time for a couple more questions. There have been so many really good substantive questions. I didn't want to stop the flow, but hey, Paige, you know, I'm a <laughs> Sorry, big yeah. fan of your work. Um, Likewise. The, the qualitative categorical analysis for the meta-analysis, how come people aren't using this technique more? It's so elegant, powerful. <laughs> I wish Why Evan was here to tell you. a greater uptake? I don't know, but it was also a pain in the butt. So... <laughs> to do it really took a lot of like thought you know because it's basically using this kind of like um set analysis so it's these sort of using I, I think you know what it is but just to sort of articulate it's like you it, it, it instead of like running things through I mean you do run things through a stats program but there's a whole lot of interpretation like that you have to do kind of like when people are doing um like my experience with um with with analysis of text you know when you when you use um Oh, what's the program people use to, to pull out um, themes from from surveys and you know from interviews and texts and stuff anyway um, yeah. you know what I'm talking about but anyway so it's it's like you you, you kind of like you get some numbers but then you have to really actually think about okay why is it that these things are grouped together versus these things what are the things they have in common and so it's a, it's a tool to help you think through the, the data and but it's it's much less I think that's part of the reason anyway like in terms of your question about why aren't people using it was it, it took a lot of iterations of thought and interpretation to kind of figure out what to do with the output of that of that analysis um, it was very rich but it was very it was like I, I really credit Evan for sticking with it and and um, pulling together all these pieces um, from all these different studies in a in a way that we could try to you know, make it interpretable to people. Thanks. So the answer, the short answer is it's tough. <laughs> well, no, it's just tough in a different way. I mean, every analysis is tough in some way, right? And every analysis has its strengths and its limitations. But, um, but I think that it's uh, it's just it's a, because it is very qualitative. It's it's a different kind of analysis that I think that maybe when people are thinking about doing meta analysis, they're looking for, you know. Uh, yeah, like what's the strength of the relationships and is it, are they, do they all tend to go this way or that way? You know, it's just like, um, it's just a really different kind of thinking. And, and so it, it's, um, it can be a little unwieldy. Yeah. Um, well, Kimsey, who is it that's joining us next week again? Um, next month we have next Dave month, Muffley. Next, <laughs> yeah. week. next week we'll we'll line up multiple. No, next month, um, March 16th, we have Dave Muffley of Oaktopia joining us, who and he will be talking about his work uh, in designing the urban forest on the Apple campus in, in California. Fantastic. And and before we paint that the I was about to say pink page, thank page. <laughs> um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, that uh, Kinsey and I are co-chairs of the UEC. Uh, we have agreed to do this for two years. I, I've been doing it for a year. I think, Kinsey, you're more like 18 months in or so. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Kinsey's term is expiring in six months and mine in, in about 12. Um, so if you're interested in um, co-chairing this for a two-year term, um, please reach out to either Kinsey or me. It is, Dexter will tell you, it is a joy to do this because you get to talk to all really cool people. It is not um, a ton of work. Um, and we appreciate um, any, you know, individuals here at this call or, or folks you may know who might be interested in that. Um, unfortunately, there's no 
no financial compensation, but you get you get the warm feeling every every second Wednesday of the month that you're bringing people together. So, uh, yeah, and and thank you, Kinsey. Just dropped our email. Um, so thank you, Paige. Let's give a, a warm thank you. So great to reconnect with you, um, and I'm glad you were able to join at UEC. And I think now now that you're on our our Google groups. Um, we hope uh, we'll hope to see you more often. Yeah, I look forward to, to, to hearing about the upcoming events. And yeah, like I said, I think there's a couple of folks here at, at UMass I'd like to, to plug in. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to doing that. Awesome, thank you everyone for joining. Bye. Thank, thank you everyone. See you next time. <laughs>